Hey guys, welcome to Hope Rescue Podcast. My name is Kimberly Scott. This is my hunky husband, Tim Scott. You're you're bringing the gun show today, babe. Uh, well, we just got out of the gym. <laughs> we did, we did, and we actually we, you can't smell us, fortunately. I never on, smell on the on the uh, podcast, but sweetie, I don't. You're I a don't. dude. No, you, have I in all of our marriage? Listen, do you ever hear me? Smell, I'm just saying. Me? Smell me. There are moments that aren't related to hygiene where there is <laughs> smells in the room. No. Then there's no me. dog to blame. There's kids. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, I have a question for you That's related not to that. That's podcast worthy. <laughs> I have a question for you about the gym. So what is the deal with men versus women? Some of you ladies out there will know what I'm talking about. It's intimidating to go to the gym, number one, and especially hang around men in 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 like the free weight zone because yes. something happens where they all turn into like monsters. But what's with the grunting it's, and the moaning? It's pretty and, much science. And the dropping of weights? No, it's, it's biology weird. and science. It is the... <laughs> it <laughs> is. It's testosterone. No, the, it's... Not, I don't do that. Sweetie, you make the funniest faces I've ever seen. I know, I seen. grimace. You're holding all that that tension inside. So as a family, we always joke about watching him at the gym. Yeah. But I've, clearly, it's paying off for you. So kudos to that because you're a stud. But it, I don't understand. Like the, the we did hear a gal today who oh was gosh. like making the most she weirdest would, noises when she would sit down. She like she was lifting weights. She'd, I know. It was weird. <laughs> it was it's weird. so obnoxious. And why it was so weird though is because it was a chick. Because you're used to that with the guys. Let's so think anyway, of it as a, a woman. Maybe you guys can let us know out there why that happens. But it, yes. it's kind of annoying. I just put my earbuds in. I think this was a little bit of a sexist type <laughs> little. Well, I got the microphone. Here. I'm opening the show. So uh, there you go. I have no control. <laughs> Hey, we've been in a series uh, based on Luke 15th. We've covered a lot of topics. We've covered how God goes to great effort to search for the lost. We've covered how God doesn't personalize our bad behavior, thank goodness, uh, about his grace and mercy and how he releases the past. And today we're going to be diving into how God won't give up on us and how he's in hot pursuit of the broken, which mm-hmm. I'm excited to uh, to jump into this. And I want to um, say last episode, if you were able to listen, you talked about uh, guilt and shame and kind of the marriage of those two, but they are actually really distinctly different. And um, I'd like you to talk about that because I think that'll set the, a good foundation. Yeah, for I'll give a couple of things. The first one is um, guilt is almost, or, or guilt can be completely private. Mm-hmm. So you can be by yourself and feel guilty. Mm-hmm. But shame always is social. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that there are people that know about it, Mm -hmm. uh, but you might perceive that they know about it. Mm -hmm. So there are things that make us feel shame when we don't even feel guilt. Now, we we talked about a few episodes ago, Adam and Eve, and they felt shame, Mm -hmm. you know, for the first time in their life. That was the first human emotion. So that kind of prompted this kind of questions that I'm getting about um, guilt and shame. We, you know, people feel shame when they think others see a flaw. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we hide our flaws. We hide our flaws. We have been using fig leaves figuratively in our lives to cover our nakedness because we don't want to be seen. We don't want to be exposed. People often feel shame for really dumb things like, like age. Mm -hmm. Maybe they feel shame because they're too young or they feel shame because they're too old. Depends on how society sees that Mm -hmm. in some Asian cultures. I see like it used to be in the United States where older people were revered. Right. And in Thailand, you really see that there's this really high reverence toward older people and they're treated with great respect. But in the United States, the older you get, or I think what happens is you start gaining uh, kind of a, uh, credibility and at some point that credibility stops and people start talking loudly to you yeah hi <laughs> hi how are you and I'm slowly. old but I can hear you know that's <laughs> but there's I think you know there's kind of crazy things that we feel shame yeah. about um you know our daughter just had a 
situation oh happened. Oh my gosh, this that is was, so funny. She was just telling yesterday, us about it. Yeah, it yesterday, yeah. I get a text yeah. from her. Actually, we were filming a podcast yesterday, and I get a text. And my phone is blowing up. I got a series of five texts from <laughs> Gracie at school, and it turns out she was in at lunch break, and just out of nowhere, a bird completely poops on her face. And But not just a little. Not just a little. It went from her face down to her shoulder. This is disgusting. Down, down jacket and we're like what did you do and she's like she said i'm trying to cover my face with the my my big water bottle so nobody will see it because the shame it's yeah. public you know and then she's like what the bell had rung we had to run to class and she's like my first thought is to go to the nurse's office yeah. i'm like what's a nurse what's, gonna do yeah, why like, do you need a nurse for I'm the like, poop? i'd go to the bathroom and wash but anyway it was it, i that's how you know you're gonna have a crappy day is when you get yes literally get deposit from a bird above but yeah but i think the shame of that was more that clearly she was surrounded by her friends yeah. and 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 it's it's an embarrassing situation but if she had been by herself she would have been grossed out but she wouldn't have felt shame. right so shame does that it, right. it shame um is that social sense of social rejection or right. fear of social rejection um i i am uh loud <laughs> i have a loud voice yeah and when we're in church uh, I used to go to the green room when I was a pastor. I'd wait in the green room and then go from the backstage up. And the reason for that is the band used to, they would be <laughs> singing and I'd sit on, the, you know, be worshiping on the front row and they're all looking at me like, hey, uh, quiet down. You know, if you can't find the key, please quiet down. <laughs> but uh, I was, the other day I was singing and Gracie was next to me and and then she keeps like laughing and looking at me like I'm a weirdo because yeah. I'm singing really loud. And then uh, we did this responsive reading last week. Yeah, I was And you were next, next to me. I gave you that sort of like subtle pinch under the arm. Like I said, listen, listen more. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with that. I was laughing. Because you were... I was we helping were, out. Well, you were leading, which you... At that point, it was the lady with the microphone that was supposed to be leading. And you were rushing the rhythm of this responsive reading. And you were you were on doing it in your own lane, babe. Hey, I, I don't have time to wait for everybody. I'm trying to get people to <laughs> so move on. I feel like you could do it. You just need to like be a little softer and listen but I, more. I, I'll be honest with you. I felt a little shame between you and Gracie. Well, you, that was the intent. You. We were actually yeah. wanting to shame you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what's funny is look thinking about Gracie in high school. High school is challenging, but junior high, you guys know, that is like a hotbed of shame for all of the silliest well, reasons. Mostly body things. Right, exactly. Yeah. So when I turned 13, I'm I'm a tall girl. I always say I'm I'm like we're we're freakishly large, yeah. the two of us, but um I'm 5'10 and I was 5'10 at age She's five, 13. Five, ten and a half. Go ahead. Yeah. So, well, with heels, I can clear like six, two. So yes. <laughs> watch out. I and like hair, it. six, four. Who knows? But anyway, it was like, I, I, at 13, people saw me and treated me as an adult and they would ask me, you know, occasionally how old I was. <laughs> and I had so much shame about telling them 13 because the reaction was always so weird, like freaked out. And then I got embarrassed and, and I felt shamed of the fact that I was a 13 year old, obviously it was circumstances I couldn't control. I was like on a fast forward pace to, to get taller, but it, yeah. it was so awkward and very, very shameful, which is, yeah. it shouldn't which, have been. Which me, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. Grace right. didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong in my responsive reading. Well, that's up for debate. Hey, I'm, I'm doing my best, <laughs> but feeling shame is not something that right. we can handle. So right. kind of to close the loop on that, but there's another thing about shame. Yeah. So the thing is the difference between guilt and shame is guilt actually moves us and motivates us to change, right? When you feel guilty about something, you yeah. feel this something within that's motivating and moving you to change something. But shame actually m motivates and moves us towards fear, which also becomes almost like a di downward spiral. It can yeah. it can be out of control and, and it's so completely opposite. Guilt says, I did wrong, right? I did wrong. And shame actually says, I am wrong. I yeah. am So it wrong. shapes your identity. Right. Who it you has, are. It's directly attached to your, uh, to your identity. And of course, that's a lie. Right, right. Um, so you talk about uh, loving sinners and um, and and loving people who obviously struggle in sin. Does that make us enablers of sin? So there, it, this is a 
kind of a problem for the church? How do we deal with sin? How do we love people? You know, that old saying, we love the sinner, we hate the sin. Yeah. Well, that fine line is so difficult. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to when you really talk about sin in scripture, and we'll be talking about this some more, uh, sin has consequences. It even though your relationship mm -hmm. with God is is based on his grace mm -hmm. that he gives you eternal life he gives you inheritance not based on your uh, merit uh, eternal inheritance but there are consequences mm -hmm. and there's a loss of intimacy mm -hmm. and that puts us at great danger so when we actively sin mm -hmm. we are putting ourselves at risk of not only being far from God, but then having that lack of intimacy that results in resolving fear right. and resolving all kinds of problems. And uh, people that live in shame constantly are struggling with how to deal with this. And I think that the church so often moves people, not just the church, but um, people in general and dealing with um, each other, mm -hmm. we have a tendency to move people to shame before they can repent. Right. And that's why what we talked about, uh, this issue in Matthew chapter 18, we need to maintain privacy. If we're going to rescue people, we need to make sure that we're maintaining privacy. And I think that's one of the problems right. in dealing with sinners. And the other thing is that, uh, people are driven to hide. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when you sin and you feel shame mm -hmm. and you feel that people are actually shaming you, right. then you hide from those people. That's why a lot of people leave the church. Sure. Uh, that's why a lot of people leave, uh, leave their small groups, their mm -hmm. community, even their friends, mm -hmm. because they haven't had the ability to, uh, deal with that sin yet. And so I think it's important for us to understand when we say that people are safe, what mm -hmm. we're saying is you're not safe to continue in sin. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is where you are in your growth, mm -hmm. we are willing to take you where you are mm -hmm. and help you move forward. Mm -hmm. And we want that for us too, yeah. so that we accept you. We know that you're struggling mm -hmm. and you're going to grow at the speed that you can grow. Right. And it's it, to me, it, it, it's so it goes back to the us and them because it's so often like that that religious mindset is speaking to you know somehow I'm more elevated than you it, we all struggle with sin we're all sinners right. so but it's so interesting to me how each of us has a predisposition to lean towards their personal list of acceptable sins right. and the ones that aren't acceptable we judge and and we call us call it's them you know yeah. those sinners yeah. and yet if we took a good look at our own lives and our own hearts we know that every day we struggle with sin and and you have somehow made your version more acceptable palatable maybe because you become callous to it but um the word's really clear like it's all missing the mark so it's really important that we uh we remember that yeah for sure let me read you this scripture about sin it comes out of john eight thirty two, and it says and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and they have never been enslaved to anyone. How is that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Yeah, that that's the problem. So when you... Sin is not innocuous. Sin right. is deadly. Right. And uh, James says that when you uh, sin, you give birth to sin mm -hmm. through temptation. You give birth to sin and sin, when it is accomplished or grows away, it brings death. Right. Sin is deadly. It, it, Adam and Eve were warned before they sinned. If you sin, you will die. Mm -hmm. And it affected their soul. It affected their psychology. It right. affected their physical bodies right. and sin is, is deadly. But when you practice sin, you become a slave. Mm -hmm. So think about people that are addicts. Right. They know they're slaves sure. or at some point they come to that they realization yeah. through a lot of loss. Uh, but these uh, Jewish people at this point, Jesus was talking to uh, these Jews and they said, we're Abraham's seed. And uh, so we're not in bondage to anyone, mm -hmm. which is kind of ironic when you think about it, because they were under Roman rule. Yeah. They were under Roman occupation and they were slaves to Rome. But anyway, mm -hmm. they felt like they were free. And Jesus cut through that. And he said, if you sin, if you practice sin, mm -hmm. uh, you are slave to sin. 
And he says the opening, what you just read is if you know the truth, will truth will set you free. That's verse 32 of John eight later on in verse 36. And mm-hmm. this is kind of a, a side note. It says, if the son therefore set you free, you will be free indeed. indeed. So right. the truth that he's talking about is himself. Right. Jesus is the way, the truth and the, the life. life. Mm-hmm. So the reality is that to be set free from sin, mm-hmm. it takes the work of Jesus Christ. How could he say in, in to our listeners, if you think about this, how can someone say the truth will set you free and then say, I'm the truth. I'm the way, the truth and the life. And you can come to the father, but by me, why is it that something, uh, what is it about Jesus that makes it unique from any other thing? Like most religions talk about how to deal with sin is, you know, through penance, doing stuff, yeah, doing stuff, <laughs> fixing it, you know, certain yeah. amount of prayer, certain amount of, uh, recitation of, of, of certain things. And, but the reality is that Jesus is the only person that can free us from sin. But as you read that scripture, it becomes very clear that when you practice sin, you become a slave to it. Right. When you first sin, you have control. Right. And, and you feel like I, I can handle this. Yeah, I can manage it. But as mm-hmm. time goes on, that sin becomes your master and you commit yourself mm-hmm. fully to it. Yeah. And what happens, is it becomes the controlling factor in your life. Right. So just because you don't have a quote addiction doesn't mean that you're not a slave. Right. When you practice sin, you'll be a slave to it. Mm-hmm. And so I got to thinking about that and wanted to share with you that there are three Greek words in the New Testament that are powerful about redemption and and purchasing. What does the word redeem mean? The word redeem means to, to purchase, buy to buy back. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were slaves in the marketplace. Yeah. And those slaves in the marketplace were in the first century. Do uh, you know what kind of slaves they were? It was, they were indentured slaves, right? Yeah. So they were they had to pay off a debt that either they inherited right. or that they had created. And then they would get passed sometimes to other slave owners. I, all kinds of slavery, obviously, is evil and wrong. But this type of slavery, sometimes, again, they would never find freedom because they'd be yeah. manipulated and carried over to another owner and another owner, correct? And, and yeah, and it, it, sometimes indentured slaves, even their children, had to be put in debtor's uh, prison yeah. or put into the... A, a home of a master who would use their labor to pay back that yeah. that debt. Yeah. And so, anyway, I, I think sometimes we think of slavery, the slavery that we saw where uh, in in America and in, in the British Empire, where mm-hmm. there were many uh, blacks from Africa that were mm-hmm. sold by um, uh, black lords mm-hmm. in those tribes. They were they were sown uh, uh, sold into slavery in other countries. And then they were abused horribly, mm-hmm. and it's an evil that's bad. Yeah. But the slavery that's talked about predominantly in the New Testament mm-hmm. is indentured slaves. Mm-hmm. So the way that worked, as you mentioned, so you would take your slave, and let's say they owed you, I'll put it in modern economic terms, they owed you $1,000, mm-hmm. and they couldn't pay it back. Mm-hmm. So what they would do is they would take uh, that slave and try to get as much as they can for that slave whether it's even more than a thousand or less than a thousand, take what they can and sell it to another master. Mm -hmm. That keeps that person in slavery. Yes. And the problem with that is that there is no way to get out of that. Romans 6, 17 says, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin and have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed, which is the teaching on Christ. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. So we we become obedient to Christ in mm-hmm. saying we we serve Christ. But this language of slavery and purchase price mm-hmm. has to do with that indentured slave. And the first Greek word that is kind of the foundational word for redemption Mm -hmm. is the word agarazzo. Mm -hmm. And that Greek word means to purchase in the marketplace, to, to pay the price. So if you want to purchase an item and, uh, you're, you're going to have to figure out what the price is. If you can negotiate that, you know, you can, you can get it. Yeah. Um, 
it reminds me a little bit of uh, the years when I was a single mom. Um, I had gone back into the workforce after having been an at at home mom, homeschool mom for, you know, my 13 years of marriage, yeah. and suddenly had to find myself some some work after being on the system for a while. And uh, so the easy spot for me was retail, and um, I was grateful to be hired at uh, at that time. There was a Saks Fifth Avenue down in Mission Valley in San Diego here, and um, I was thrilled about that because I knew that uh, the price point of their products was very high and it was also a commission-based system. So um, they hired me for the St. John line. And I told them when I came in for the interview, I said, I, I just have to tell you, I... I can never, and I will never be able to purchase anything St. John because <laughs> these were like $500 for just like a tank top, you know? And, wow. but, but I said, I will do my best to sell this product for you. But there, and, and, you know, the, 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 the season that I worked there, um, it was a huge blessing because of the commission and helping to get income for my kids. But I, I didn't buy a single thing. And even with a discount, I could not justify the price price point that was there. And because I'm hardwired to like love TJ Maxx yeah. or Ross or thrift stores, to be honest with you, that's what I was doing with yeah. my kids. They grew, grew out of clothes so much. But um, yeah, when we were in Thailand, uh, went there many times, we had a ministry there and um, they have these kind of a, their flea market yeah. kind of a deal. And you actually negotiate on the price, right. kind of like we used to do in Tijuana. Very common you know, you, in Asia. Yeah. yeah. And you negotiate the price. And I'm negotiating over these, you know, Folexes, you know, these Rolexes <laughs> that were fake. And I, I remember going, and I'm pushing back. And finally, the gal that was with me, she goes, you know, you're negotiating for about 50 cents. <laughs> like, just buy it. You can't afford 50 cents. <laughs> But that's that purchase price. So think about what is the purchase price right. of our salvation, yeah. of our forgiveness. Right. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ died, paid the price. It's a non-negotiable right. price. Right. The wage of sin is death. death. And Jesus Christ paid the penalty for that sin. Sin is devastating mm -hmm. to us because it kills us. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to us. We're a fallen, we live in a fallen world. We're right. all sinners. And the second Greek word is ek agarazo. So agarazo means to purchase in the marketplace. So if you go back to the slave uh, idea, the slave is in the marketplace, you pay the price. That's what the word agarazo means. But ek agarazo has that preposition at the beginning and it means out of. So it literally means to purchase this in the marketplace and take it out. Mm -hmm. So think about that. You are a slave. Mm -hmm. Now you have a new master that's taking you out. And um, for the sake of time, I won't go into scriptures about it, but it's a beautiful thing how God purchases back. back. He mm -hmm. redeemed us under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And no longer are we identified as sinners. We're mm -hmm. identified as sons. And we right. call God Abba Father, Abba Father, which is such a cool yeah, thing. Yeah. And then the third word and, and the final word used for redeem in scripture is the word latruo. Mm -hmm. And it means to set free or to loose. Mm -hmm. And so here's the picture that uh, Paul uh, uses as well as Jesus uses this. And that is that they go into the marketplace. You see someone there that is stuck in sins, a, a sinner who needs salvation that person is purchased in the marketplace. They're taken out of the marketplace. And then Jesus sets us free from sin. Mm. And what a beautiful picture of salvation. Yeah. And so even though sin plagues us uh, our whole life, even from the time we get saved, we don't stop sinning. Right. We know that pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality is that we have been set free. Right. And in Christ, we no longer are identified by our sin. And even though sin impacts our relationship, mm -hmm. our, our intimacy with God, mm -hmm. it doesn't destroy our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Our salvation is secure no matter how much we fail. Right. So it's based on his grace. Right. And this final uh, scripture says, Titus 2, 13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that. The great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus is referred to there not only as Savior, but God. Yes. And Jesus is God, and he gave himself up 
as a latruo to redeem us, to mm-hmm. buy us for all of our lawlessness and impurity and so forth. And he has that possession uh, that, that he has bought. Yeah. And so we belong to Christ. That's who we belong to. And so when we talk about God never giving up on yeah. us, he just, <laughs> he paid the absolute ultimate price. Right. And if you are wondering whether or not God loves you, God loves you enough that anyone who believes in the name of Jesus Christ can have mm-hmm. eternal life. We have that by his grace, this free gift given to him, mm-hmm. given to us by him, and we have eternal life through him. So yeah. it's a really powerful thing. God never gives up on us. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't give up on us, and he has set us free, which is, uh, we're so grateful for that. And um, remember that this week, when you're going into the week, that um, you've never gone too far. He's not given up on you, and he wants to give you freedom. You guys, we're getting ready to wrap it up here, but I want to invite you to episode eight, where we're going to be talking about how to see the best in people. So do us a favor, let somebody know that might need to hear that message, tag them, tag a friend, tell a friend, and uh, join us on hoperescue.org, and we look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. God bless.